Hi again, everyone. And uh, Design Open uh, has been set some years ago. It used to be uh, on-site events out of Bangalore. And now we are global, but we have been through a journey. So I'll uh, take a few seconds to, to share that journey and allow all the people to come in. And then uh, we'll begin this session. This session has been uh, labeled DICE. Design, Innovation, Culture, and Entrepreneurship. And we are super privileged to have uh, speakers uh, ranging uh, from different parts of the world, and I'll come to that. So my name is uh, Alok Nandi, and uh, I'm here with uh, Sonia Manchanda. Sonia has launched Design Open in Bangalore five years ago, and uh, <clears throat> we have been uh, having sessions in a place called Design Barn, which was co-founded by Sonia and Partners. And uh, this place hosted physical events. And some months ago, we decided to have uh, some events out of Bangalore. So we went to the Design Week in Kochi, the Design Week in Hyderabad, and then pandemic hit. And so here we are online. Last year, we had a season called Design Open Happy. So you can check designopen.in slash happy online. We had number of speakers every 15 days. Then we launched Design Open Kolkata, looking at the future of education. And here we are back with uh, Design Open DIC. The aim of DIC was to explore how to reconnect and rethink about uh, creativity at large. So today we have a session of 99 minutes and we said, wow, 99 minutes, nine speakers. How are we going to play with that and make sure that uh, we have interesting conversations? So thank you speakers coming from uh, Brazil, from Kuala Lumpur, from India, from Europe. It's quite a unique construct being able to connect uh, Brazil to Malaysia via India and Europe. And uh, we decided that uh, in order to share this huge range, we will compress. We will compress the time we give to uh, speakers in order to create kind of uh, dense and interesting moments, hopefully. So the session will be split in three moments. We will have a first part where nine of us will have 99 seconds to share a provocation, an insight, a series of thought. And connected to that, we will begin to ping pong to interact. So second moment will be the interactions. And then third moment will be interacting with you audience. So this gives us the frame of this uh, design open session. Designopen.in, the website, will uh, host the recording of this session. So speakers, the session will be recorded. Audience, you can go back to this and uh, zoom back and look at what has been shared. The structure of what we have been uh, working on is uh, based on, as I mentioned, the provocations. So none of us knows what the other is gonna talk about. That's the rules of the game. And then we'll begin to interconnect. Before jumping in, knowing that time is uh, flying and that we have only 99 minutes, I would like to thank all the speakers to have agreed to come on board and play with those rules, the rules of the game. I would also like to thank uh, the Design Open team and Sudai and all the others to make sure that uh, everything is uh, running smooth. In terms of uh, interactions, we have the chat box where many of you are punching in where they are coming from. And we have a Q&A box. The Q&A box will allow you to put your questions and uh, some of us will answer and feedback and react on that. Sonia, 
I covered, I guess, all the logistics. Yes, we yeah. are very good. Cool. Mm. Are we all set, uh, speakers? Yes, great. We are seeing the audience coming in. Amazing uh, range of places where you are connecting from. We know it's early morning in Brazil. So thank you for all of you to join us in this early phase. We know it's getting uh, evening and lunchtime in uh, Malaysia and Southeast Asia. So thank you for uh, coming and spending time with us. We also have, I see people from Italy and other parts of the planet. So uh, I guess we are slowly getting ready for moving into our uh, series of 99 seconds. What I'll do is uh, quickly share with the audience the names of the speakers and uh, just let you know where they are coming from. And then you'll discover through their stories what they are busy with. So my name is Alok Nandi. I'm based in Brussels, Belgium, and I'm heading Spread Design Europe. And then we'll have Clarissa Biolchini. She's based in uh, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil and uh, she's heading Archipelago. Then we'll have William Harald Luong, who's based in Kuala Lumpur. He's heading two companies, but we'll know more about that. And then we have Claudia Niemeyer. She's based in uh, Zurich. But remember, we are traveling everywhere. So Claudia is coming from Brazil, based in Zurich, and uh, we'll see some interconnections uh, emerging. After Claudia, we'll have Joseph. 170 persons. Joseph is based in uh, <clears throat> Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. And after Joseph, we'll have Ali, Ali Hill. He's also based in Malaysia. And uh, after Ali, we'll uh, get the 99 seconds from Christopher. Christopher Erickson is based in Kuala Lumpur, but coming from Copenhagen and uh, contributing to this uh, nomadic life that uh, many of us have, interconnecting stuff. And then we'll have Luis, Luis Alt, who's uh, currently in Sao Paulo. And uh, we'll end this series with Sonia Manchanda based in uh, Bangalore. So that gives you the range of uh, the speakers and their names, the place where they are currently based, which means something but maybe means nothing because we are all for everywhere. So thank you audience, we are having a fascinating range of uh, cities and we'll uh, slowly jump into uh, what we call the provocations. What did we mean by provocation? Might be a question. As designers, as creative entrepreneurs, as innovators, Design Open is about looking at emergence, is about decoding emergence. That is how Sonia and myself, we frame Design Open. That means that we need to be curious and listen and try to get into a provocation mode. Provocation can be <clears throat> provided, provocation can be received. It's a kind of interactive modality that we want to push. So each speaker here will share in 99 seconds a set of provocations. And we'll ask the audience to keep traces of that because you might use some of them to ping back and ask questions. We'll ask the same to the speakers. Remember some of the provocations because we'll try to interconnect some of the notions with the others. So this gives the kind of uh, overall setup. We have the chat box for any comment and we have the Q&A box for questions, as I mentioned, and uh, we will now jump into that. What we shall do maybe is uh, put a time watch so that we'll try to stick to that rule of 99 seconds, which is a complex rule, but we'll try to stick to that. So I'll jump into that, being the first one providing the 99 seconds, and then I'll pass the baton to the next speaker and we'll move from speaker to speaker. 
Are we ready, everyone? Speakers, are you ready? Yep. Great. So uh, time to jump in. It's uh, 11 minutes after the hour for those of uh, you who are in a zone time zone where it begins at the hour. It's 41 for those who are in India. So uh, let's uh, jump into uh, what we call the provocations and uh, I'll jump in and then we'll have uh, the next one which I'll introduce after. Great. So 2021. Systems are stuck. How can that be? What can we work on to release the creative energy of people? That is what I have been thinking here as a design open platform, having all these uh, speakers with me together, having all this audience and reflecting on one core idea. We know that we don't know. What can we do when we know that we don't know? And how can we envision new connections and how can we help in reconnecting these four keywords, D-I-C-E, design, innovation, culture, and entrepreneurship. These four words are what we call polysemic words. They mean so many different things to so many people. And then I thought, okay, we have D-I-C-E. Let me bring to you, dear speakers, and their audience three other words in order to begin to interconnect. The three words I would like to share with you are diverse or diversity. The second one is dense or density. And the third one is distributed. Dense because we need to have passion, density. Diverse, because we are here a diverse set of people. And my key assumption is that diversity is what is needed in our planet to rethink, reframe. And the third one is distributed. Without our distributed systems, we would not be in a position to have this kind of conversation. How can we leverage on distributed? And I'll end these 99 seconds and give the floor to the next speaker. And the next speaker is Clarissa. Clarissa Bielkini, she's based in Rio de Janeiro, and she's going to jump into this 99 seconds exercise, and then we'll go to the next one. Clarissa, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Very happy to be here. Amazing audience. Hello, everyone. Um, my provocation is about the role of the designer, um, as we are all designers, and I love our profession. Um, I've been thinking very much lately about our role in the world and how we can really contribute to, um, to better solutions for our planet. I think, um, this, uh, I, I think design, uh, sustainability and circular design will be the next wave of design and I don't think we are ready for it yet. So I think it's going to be a big big challenge for us and we are very much able to to get this uh, you know uh, trigger and uh, so what are we really how are we really planning how are we going to take this challenge and how can we as designers really contribute to a better future including planet and people of course so this is my provocation I don't know if I reached 99 seconds. <laughs> Arisa, you still have 37 seconds. <laughs> okay. Uh, Locke is very precise. So uh, what, I'm, what I want to say at my 30, sec at my 30 last seconds is uh, it's amazing to have these connections between all of you guys here. And I think together we are stronger. Um, I'm really glad to see my friends from Malaysia and Brazil and India together here. I'm really excited about how we can really do things together and plan things together. So why not get connected over the globe to think about global, global uh, challenges and global problems. So I think this is what we have to do and we are starting today. So Great. that's why I'm really happy. Yeah. Thanks, Clarissa. So Clarissa was zooming in from uh, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil and uh, we'll move to our next speaker and uh, have uh, the provocation from William. William Harold okay. Wong is based in KL and William, uh, looking forward to hearing your voice. 
Oh, thank you. Can you hear me clearly? Yeah. Yes. Okay, thanks. So um, many of our projects are culture related and I see myself as an observer. In the countries where we work, uh, Malaysia, Hong Kong, Brunei and the United Arab Emirates, I really try to understand how in each country, how culture influences design and in the longer term, how design shapes culture. Um, you know, culture is a social process. It is dynamic and adapts to new influences. It brings new ideas, forms, and meanings, and sometimes reshaping traditional ones, which is an area which I'm really interested in. So for me, working in different countries, um, cultural design must be collaborative. I am a designer moving into a region outside of my own leaf experience. Right? At best, my design can only touch the surface. You know, influenced by what I see around me, the people I talk to, ideas and physical objects in the museum, books, desk research. I may design a beautiful object you know, using appropriated motifs from that culture which I encounter, but really how can I communicate deeper to this community? Because I have not lived the experience of the locals who each have a personal memory, a real sense of place and belonging, social interaction, national narratives. I'm missing all that. As it is common nowadays to work across national borders, I think collaborating to tap into personal and collective memories can inspire the design of really innovative products and services that are able to connect deeply with society. So that's my thoughts. Thank you. Thanks, William. Thanks for sharing this. And uh, I would like to remind the audience that uh, you are happy to contribute and bring some provocations. I see them, some of them coming in the, in the chat box. And uh, Fernando is asking uh, how to uh, intervene in a post-pandemic fragile society. So uh, remember, we are in a distributed system. So all of you contribute in the chat box and we'll try to interconnect some of them. Thanks, William. You are zooming in from uh, Kuala Lumpur, and we'll move to uh, the next speaker who's based in Zurich, Claudia. Claudia, as I mentioned, is uh, based in Zurich, but coming uh, initially from Brazil. Claudia Thanks, Niemeyer, Claudia. the floor is yours. Yes. Hi, all. Thanks for the invitation. Actually, what I have in mind is really related to my day-by-day -day life here. I work in a big consultant company. And in this last year, we changed the structure of everything the experience, right? How we work, how we shop, how we exercise, the relationships we have. And also the organizations need are really looking forward for a turning point and a pivot. How they can address this change that we are living now and we are aiming for to live. And they need to calibrate, the organizations need to calibrate how they can uh, actually redesign their structure, their growth formula, their strategies to address our current needs. They are different from two years ago, for example, and we're going to keep changing. So the question, the key question that I have in mind is, what, how do we can create relevance in people's life and never changing lives? And how do we grow uh, when the traditional growth formula is just traditional. So we cannot just, the companies cannot be that traditional as he, they have been. So it's a time for change inside the organizations. And we are aiming and the organization is struggling that, and there's also an, an opportunity and a space for a new category of leadership. And we have a space for this to emerge. And what I have in mind is what is this kind of leadership? What is the, the need and the mindset that we need? How ready are the, the companies to have this new kind of leaders and what they, we can have in the future that they can deliver? That is what I've been thinking about. Thank you, Claudia. You see that in a few minutes, in a number of seconds, we have so many keywords which are triggering reflections and attention. And I see the same happening uh, in the chat box. So uh, the challenge we have is we are getting so many interesting insights. How are we going to keep trace of that? How are we going to 
push the conversations after this design open session is one of the challenge that I set to all of us as speaker and audience. And moving to the next speaker, I propose to give the floor to Joseph. Joseph is based uh, in Malaysia and the floor is yours. Joseph, your mic is muted. Hi, everybody. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Um, uh, today, I'm going to just going to touch on three challenges that I have uh, on a daily basis. And that touches on three keywords. One is uh, stewardship. One is uh, share resources. And the third one is change. So number one, I'm always asked that, you know, uh, have I been a good steward or a good manager to the resources entrusted to me? I believe that these resources, which is my time, my talent, my belief, my value system, my health, my network, they are not mine, but given to me in this life. So have I used it wisely to make a better change through my strength in the world we lived in? The second challenge, have I shared these resources with my colleagues, my, co my community, my students, my clients, and the people in need? Have I exercised the spirit of neighbor? I talk about uh, neighbor. I, I remember when I was a kid, I used to go to my neighbor house to watch TV and they come to my house to learn uh, uh, piano or music. And my grandma used to share her cooking tips and always exchange e ingredients with our neighbor whenever needed. And it's always welcome. 10 years ago, a few of my friends and, and, and us, we started a, a program called uh, Neighbor that tailored to the schools in Southeast Asia uh, country. The objective uh, basically to learn and to share and to exchange uh, resources with each other. Three, have I influenced my client and my partners that make that difference together with me? Have I tapped into their resources as well together with mine to impact their customer, stakeholders, staff, and community. The world needed us like never before, good ideas, better design, sustainable material, and effective uh, communications are what we can do to make that positive change, starting from you, your family, your community, and the world. Now, thank you. Thank you, Joseph. So, Time is flying, but insights are getting dense, dense, and dense. Remember, one of the key words I proposed was density, and we have a bunch of passionate speakers sharing their insights. And the next one will be Ali, Ali Hill. She's also based in uh, Malaysia. Ali, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Um, I haven't left much time to introduce myself, so <laughs> I have kind of written it out in time myself and I've kind of like really made it 99 seconds, hopefully, <laughs> if I speak fast. So I will leave my introduction to a little bit later if we have time. Um, so I'll go straight into it. I want to address a very beautiful and natural resource that I observe coming through so strongly in our difficult times as, uh, in the past few years. So here's what I propose one of the most provocative things that you can do in design and communications is to make people laugh, no matter how serious the subject is. How do you put a smile in the mind and why is it so powerful? Firstly, maybe I should explain what do I mean by humor in design? It can be visual wittiness uh, in cartoons or illustrations or creative layouts, for example. Wit and creativity, they go hand in hand, yeah? So, or it can be, you know, innocently pointing out the ridiculousness of a situation. Governments are generally um, very good at supplying this kind of ridiculous situations for us, right? Uh, so plenty of um, resources there. Um, another thing, uh, juxtapositioning, um, juxtaposing, sorry, a, a funny headline with a serious image, for example, or vice versa, to create a sense of irony. Um, or making parodies of well-known scenarios. A lot of viralized memes do this, don't they? Um, or using satire, sarcasm, exaggeration, wit, 
the list goes on and on. And, but here's why I think it's powerful. Because humor unites your audience. When they get your joke, they feel included. Their intelligence is aroused and you win them over. And humor is infectious and very, very shareable. Thirdly, humor is the enemy of authority. Nothing undermines authority like holding it up to ridicule. It is a little bit harder to be afraid of something when you can laugh at it. And yet, humor is gentle. True humor is never cruel. Bullying, for example, is not humor. Humor gently invites us to even laugh at ourselves or to laugh together at the situation. And in this way, it opens a door for us to acknowledge our common humanity and vulnerability. So lastly, I know this is obvious, but it sparks joy. It is our coping mechanism especially in gentler Asian societies like where we come from, where direct conflict, confrontation, and taking up arms is actually very difficult and scary for our cultures, right? So we have lost many things in these challenging times, but may we never ever lose our sense of humor. Thanks, Ali. Ali, thanks for sharing this and uh, show us the uh, ample range of thoughts and approaches that we are having already through all these conversations and insights. And uh, Ali, as you mentioned, you'll have a chance to introduce some of your journeys and approaches later when we'll interact. So don't worry about that. And uh, we are putting pressure to give some ideas and then we'll interconnect. And I'll give the floor now to uh, Chris, Christopher. Christopher is the Danish uh, in KL, if I may say Thank so. You. Thank you so much, Alok. You may. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'll try to keep it short here. Uh, basically, I think uh, what I'm seeing from our work in Malaysia and across uh, Asia Pacific with large organizations is that there's an increased curiosity and interest in design. Uh, but the starting point of these large organizations in terms of design maturity is very low. And that um, in many ways, all of our lives in uh, society is affected by these humongous global organizations as well as government organizations and, and large local companies. But design skills is not enough to earn a seat at the big table in these organizations. There was a question in the chat around are organizations ready to have designers as leaders? I will in a way maybe flip it around and ask the question, are we ready to lead, right? Because for design to deliver its full potential in large organization, I think we need to truly redesign business models, how organizations work, how work culture is, uh, employee experiences, thinking of them just as you would for a customer, customer experiences. Um, as designers, we have on about empathy with users and customers, but how much do we truly understand about our customers and stakeholders' needs in large organizations? Imagine what we can learn from other professions, such as psychologists, entrepreneurs, campaigners, strategy consultants, finance professionals. For us to be able to create the true impact of, that design can, can deliver, we need to have empathy with the stakeholders in these large organizations because they are the ones that's going to shape our future, whether we like it or not. Thank you, Chris. We see that <laughs> from speaker to speaker, we are changing point of view, scale, scope, and that is where it's becoming so fascinating. And uh, from Chris based in KL, we'll go on the other side of the planet with Luis. Luis, are you ready to zoom in? Luis is based yes. in Sao Paulo. Yeah. Yes, hello, so thank you. Yours. Hello everyone all hello. over the world. So today uh, I want to bring my uh, provocation for the practice of designing for services. Uh, specifically, I want to question why we've been approaching the practice as a mirror of the industrial process of developing goods, uh, which is a linear journey that is, ends up with a specification of a product that will remain the same forever. Um, so services are not like that. Services are changing all the time. They have elements, they have uh, digital interfaces, they have physical spaces, they have people, and you can't manufacture services. They evolve over time. Uh, you can't ship a service, hardly. And since design has moved to impermanent things, why are we designing as if services were permanent, fixed? So this is my provocation. 
Thanks, Luis, and thanks for shaking uh, the linear thinking that our planet is uh, frozen in. And we'll come back yes. to that one. Super. After Luis, uh, we'll go back to Bangalore, India with Sonia. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Alok. It's so interesting to listen to everyone. But what I've been thinking about is the fact that, you know, let's face it. We are in a crisis that is disrupting everything that we knew to be true and real. You know, there is no looking back to the ways in which we have lived, loved, learned, worked, behaved, just moving forward. You know, that's the only choice we have. And therefore, when you look at leadership, the only sense-making strategy that leaders have today is looking at fizzy data that's emerging, projecting positive future scenarios, uh, creating possibilities, wrestling down fear with as much imagination as possible. But first though, I think what we all need to do is sort of break that coconut, shatter a rigid mindset, you know, in a fixed mindset that we've had and be open, which is why we have this event. And to let's accept that this moment of a big shift is an opportunity for creativity and we need super leadership, super and creative leadership, dreamers, imagineers, path breakers, change makers, um, these are these new hybrid creative superheroes and they're rising. You will suddenly see that all across the world, there are these people maybe who've been working and thinking in a different way, whose time has come now, who are coming up with an alternative reality, alt milk, alt education, alt learning, everything is alt, you know, with fewer negative consequences. So that's why DICE plays a role. These are the people who are, who have the empathy of designers who are curious about new technologies, like innovators, who understand and deeply respect cultures and learn from them, and who have a bold entrepreneurial spirit. This is the moment for many, many, many more such leaders. And so at the Design Barn here in Bangalore, we've taken, we've made a commitment to actually create the vibe and create the tribe and create a program around which, so like an incubator where people actually can sort of take it on, create a safe space to imagine a better future. So to be able to reboot our own mindsets and our own ways of thinking, to reframe problems as opportunities, to reimagine, regenerate, rebound really. You know, so basically we're saying, you know, be open, shape superheroes with dice, and then let's make the choice consciously to dare. We also come from a relatively timid culture, but we can make the choice to dare to design, act, react to what's going on just now. So that's really what I've been thinking about. Great, thanks Sonia. Luis, if I may, you are embodying the notion of alt with your name, <laughs> Luis Alt. <laughs> yes. I was quite fascinated <laughs> and say, okay, let's, let's okay. ping the ball to Luis now. Thank you all of you for having shared your provocations. Okay. And Luis, I'll ping the ball to you and say, sure. how are any of the insights <laughs> that you have heard so far? Is there something which you find burning and you want to ping back to one of the other speakers and then we'll begin to play the ping pong if you are okay? Great, yes, of course. So I loved, uh, well, well, thank you everyone for sharing such in insightful um, provocations. I, I loved Alison's uh, talk on the uh, humor, but I would say smiling and making people feel good uh, because I can relate to that. We've been um, as designers uh, very focused on function. I would say in, it, it doesn't matter the area, but specifically I would say in services and, and, and digital uh, product design, uh, we've been pretty much focusing on, on helping people to do some things uh, and to do it uh, fast flow, uh, with a good user flow, frictionless. Uh, but I agree and I, I, I see. So, so the provocation that Alison made got me in the sense that I think we should be able to insert more humor, more meaning, more... Uh, uh, to, to turn services more witty. I'm not sure if that's the, the proper word to say. Uh, so I, I enjoyed that. Thank you, Alison. Great. The ball goes to who? 
who wanna take the floor? William, I love your approaches of interconnecting culture and design, design and culture. And I see yeah. that it permeates. So uh, tell us more. Okay. Um, maybe I will talk about something which uh, I heard a few minutes ago. And it is also from Alison. <laughs> The fact that she said that humor uh, heals society uh, could be my own words because we are facing another crisis. It's not only an environmental crisis, not only the pandemic crisis, the global warming, but the cultural crisis. People seem to hate each other now. People are so divided. And you can see from big countries in the US to small countries in Malaysia, there is, I'm not, I'm not sure whether diversity is really uh, helping. It's not an utopia, but it can also cause us a lot of problems and, you know, um, challenges. And I think we are facing a very serious problem in people's perception of the other. And how can designers actually dive into this? It's as serious as plastics in the ocean. It's as serious as global warming. I think this division of people, of different tribes, of different clans, or different nationalities, or different groups, is really something we need to, what, what can we do as the designers to resolve this or help to resolve this? That's my provocation number two. <laughs> Thanks, William. Uh, Chris, you want to <laughs> react on that one? Thanks. I'm not sure I have the answer for that one. I think I agree it's important. <laughs> um, I think my mind was maybe somewhere else, so maybe I'll start there. I think I'm, I'm, I'm curious about the maybe continuing with my provocation here uh, <laughs> a little bit. Uh, I'm curious about um, design is not enough to change the world, right? To provoke a bit here amongst yeah. the colleagues, right? Uh, just like which, finance is not enough. or Which we can see in the chat, by the way, which is interesting. And strategy is not enough, right? We need to all come together uh, and leverage design as one of the ways to bring us all together. Uh, right, so I think the role of kind of facilitating conversations uh, to some extent, what we're doing here, the role of uh, creating spaces for listening, for reflection, for questioning, for experimentation uh, is key. And I think that um, in a way, design has been maybe um, uh, boxed in as graphic design, UI, UX, and so on. And I think design has a lot more to offer. Um, uh, I saw Sangeeta mention that, you know, what can a designer do uh, to be positioned as a leader? So maybe someone, uh, I can pass the baton to someone here. <laughs> to, 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 um, to not steal too much microphone time here. Th thanks, Chris. And I see quite some interesting uh, resonance with what William said. And I would propose to ping back to Claudia if she's okay. Uh, yes. We heard the word stewardship. We heard the word leadership. Uh, Claudia. Some insight. Yes, uh, I really agree with William mentioned about, and, and also Luis, about the design for connections. And we need to make the conversation closer. And I took some notes here that we need, to, I think sometimes we are too much designers and we need to get this conversation out of our bubble. So, and think also to address the points that William raised regarding economy, environment, uh, technology, social. And we are, we are not able to answer all those questions related to those topics. And we need to bring people with that knowledge to the conversation to address those points that are really important. So like customer experience became a buzzword and like everybody is working on it, but it's too focused on customer. There's much other topics around the customer and the human, like the employees, for example, inside the companies. To, address, to, have, to provide a customer experience, we need to have a good experience inside the companies. We need to have a great experience in terms of the, all the other touch points that uh, we will raise here also. So uh, bringing, and we need to open a space to bring those people to, that, to the table to talk about it that sometimes I don't feel we, we are ready for that, for it. We don't have the vocabulary, don't have the space. We, we don't know how to do it. I think we need to think, and I think who would be aiming and looking for and able to do it would be us, you know? So I, I don't know how to do it still, like I try to do, 
But I think we should think about how can we bring those thoughts, those people to address the, those topics here. Thanks, Claudia. Uh, if I may, uh, I have a, a suggestion. Joseph has a fascinating story, and I hope Joseph will agree to share that. And it's focused on one key word, which uh, Joseph shared some minutes ago, dignity. Joseph, you have been working with that name Dignity and you did a fascinating project in KL. I think it would be great if you agree to share that with the audience and the others because it's inspirational. Yeah, I think that's, a, that's, a, that's quite a true manifestation of what I just shared, which is uh, uh, be a good steward and, and, and also how we sort of work with other people and to share resources. And uh, uh, Dignity was ba uh, uh, basically uh, offer education to stop the uh, cycle of uh, poverty. And uh, to do that, they can't do it, do it on their own. You know, they have to be engaged with, into the area that they are not, for, not familiar with. For example, design, for example, brand, for example, uh, gardening, for example, uh, uh, a maker space, for even example, like, you know, uh, are working with, with barbers or hairstylists to, to teach the kids uh, that is not very good in studies, but rather to, to, to work on, uh, on scales. I think um, uh, in the entire uh, uh, process on working with dignity, I, I can see that people coming together uh, out from their, their comfort zone. A writer came out from their com comfort zone and we came to the table and we have, we have this chef and, and, and we have seen a pastors, which is a religious people, right? But that, that all, come, all come together. That's a beautiful manifestation of uh, a, shared, a shared resources co uh, coming together that, you know, I think for, for me, who is doing design, I'm always into craft. I'm always into uh, the positions, but then without know, knowing that that may not be important to, to someone from the, from the other end. So when we all come, uh, come together, that we're able to empathize. I mean, this is probably one of the, the, the best uh, uh, example where, you know, you have to have a, a bit less of you, but more of the others. I think then we can work together. But con uh, uh, contrary for me as well, I I'm too big on myself, you know, so it will be tough for me to go into that table to share my, my talent and my gift. So in order to do that, uh, Cla uh, Claudia, to answer your question, we have to then uh, uh, minimize our ego and perhaps uh, a smaller us in order to work with the others. Yeah. Thanks, Joseph. Clarissa, what about uh, pinging in from uh, Rio? What I would like also first, Clarissa, is to thank you because Clarissa, Sonia and myself, we have been talking about this design open session and Clarissa is uh, the person who seems to be based in Rio, mm. <laughs> but she has been in so many places and she is more uh, Kuala Lumpurian than many Kuala Lumpurians. So Clarissa, <laughs> the floor is yours. So just if I may, Alok, I would like to thank yeah. Clarissa for inviting me to this uh, conversation. Okay, so just uh, I, I, I should have uh, th thanked her in my, in my <laughs> talk. Thank you, Clarissa. You're welcome, my friends. Um, I was just telling Alok that I'm really, I'm really touched by this event. Um, I'm really happy because, um, as Alok said, I lived in Malaysia for when I was a young designer for four years. Uh, and um, that's when I met William. William was my boss and uh, my mentor, and I met Joseph and Ali. We worked together in William R. Wong's associate and associates. And William was a great uh, teacher to all of us because he was already a senior at that time, and he was very inspiring. And um, culture was something that he was already saying at that time. Remember, guys? And um, I think it's really time to think to to think about these issues. And uh, today I'm really touched because Alok has invited me. I met Alok a few years ago at, um, at an event in uh, Europe. And Sonia, I have been following her for many years because she does amazing work. If you don't know Sonia's work, just follow her work because she's really a great leader in India. 
And then I, I, uh, we spoke to Alok and so on and said, let's, let's make an event connecting India, Brazil and Malaysia. And then I said, why not connecting Malaysia? Because Alok has a, had a connection with Christopher in Malaysia. And I was like, great, why not? Why, why, um, isn't this a great opportunity to, you know, to get back together? Because I was in Malaysia 20 years ago and I lived in Europe later and uh, I keep in touch with them but it's so far away but now uh, we are, I see that we are so connected and then when we got the opportunity to make this event and I invited Louise and Claudia which are great friends of mine and, and that I admire a lot they do great work in Brazil I was like oh, um, this is the time really for, for connection and for I, I'm making this introduction because I wanted to say this before but the ping pong was too fast so um, I really, <laughs> sorry, Alok, I'm, I'm being a bit long here, but um, I really wanted to say those things, and I'm really happy to see all these people from all over the world here, uh, people that I know, uh, people who were like my, my students in university, people who work with me, really, Alice is here, she worked with us, uh, thank you, Ali and Fiong, and I'm really, I'm really touched. Um, so guys, I think um, this is really a time taking Sonia's provocation that really touched my heart and Joseph's also uh, thoughts on, on uh, resources. I was thinking about all this and, and getting together all the, all the things that you, you, you have said here, Alison and Louis and Claudia and Christopher and, and everyone else and Alok. Um, thank you for being here. And I think well, this is really time for change, really. And I think this is really time for us as designers to get out of our bubble, as Claudia said, and what can we really do um, to, to, to make these connections happen and to make great leadership uh, arise, real, uh, real leadership, authentic people doing authentic things uh, to make our lives better, not only our lives as a human species, but also to our planet. That's why... I was thinking about sustainability. It's a low theme and we've been talking about this for 30 years, but circular design is really the next wave, I think. And circular in all uh, aspects, I would say, because it's not, it's not only about materials, but it's also about how, what are we doing with all this technology? And <clears throat> when we're doing a project, uh, how can we bring the, the best resources together and really make uh, people's, people's lives better? Customer experience is not only about the experience, as Claudia said. So um, my, it's more, it's not a provocation, it's, it's just thoughts. And um, I think when we get great minds together, not only us, but also the, our, our connectors, our, our audience here is giving so much, so many amazing insights. I was asking a lot, can we, can we um, register all these thoughts and, and questions? And what can we do with these later on? maybe create new projects, I don't know, like, like Joseph's projects. So um, yeah, design is about connection is, and is also about people and we are all humans. And I think we have a great power really to make this change happen, uh, making relationships better, making better services, using our resources, not only our human resources, but also our planet resources to, to create a real better future for all of us. And it's all about humanity, isn't it? And culture is, 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 a, is a result of all, of all this. So what are we doing when we are fighting about politics and stupid things? <laughs> and why are we so, uh, you know, separated in, in terms of values if we are all in one planet and we're, and we're all here at this time, 2021, living in the same planet, right? So thank you, Thanks. everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Marie, for your contributions. She's a good friend and she works with leadership heart. Thank you. Can I add I can. something? Sure. Yeah, sure. Uh, because I uh, like I'm with you, Clarissa, and I believe that you it's a, for sure the time is now. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities to to have some a lot of changes, and there's a need for a lot of changes. And but to make those changes, we also need to change the way we work. So it's also an opportunity to, for us to review what we learned, you know, the way we do, the way we position ourselves and like the way we address design to our clients, to our students, to our life. So 
that is the provocation that I, I, I've been thinking about it for a while because I can see this opportunity every day. I can see the need mm-hmm. of, of the change every day. And I'm still struggling how to change in all my day-by-day <laughs> life. But I, I think we need to try. We need to change. We, we don't have a model. Nobody's going to come with a framework to us to say this is going to be the new way of working, you know? So, and it's on our hands. And we have a big influence on people. So this is my provocation. Like if you if you try something that is good for you and we have an open space here to share, like we should share because it's really important for that time. Thanks, Claudia. Uh, I, I propose to give the floor to, to Christopher, but before I have just one question, how to avoid circular to become linear? Because Lewis used the word linear thinking and Clarissa came with circular is the new <laughs> next. My fear is that in many places I see circular design being so fashion that I, it might become linear. So I'll leave with that thought and I'll give the floor to Chris. Thank you. And, and then um, Louis, of course, you'll feed back on the linear versus circular. <laughs> <laughs> Great curation uh, I guess um, I guess my, my curiosity is a little bit around actually there are so many technologies, so many services, so many products that are already more circular, more sustainable, better for people, feels better, uh, are more economically just and so on. We actually know a lot about what works and there are lots of experts in all kinds of domains for all the SDGs and so on, right? So uh, for me, a massive break path for a sustainable world is actually not the technology. We know a lot about what works. It's actually the organization's uh, uh, inability to adapt fast enough to change and to become truly empathetic with uh, government being empathetic with citizens and business and and everybody. Uh, Business is not just being empathetic with the shareholders. Uh, In a way, you can say that a lot of design energy and and budgets and and brain power has been uh, uh, used on creating beautiful things that are bad for everyone, right? If if I were to provoke a little bit, right? Um, So the question is, how can we use our brain power and what we know also from science, from finance and so on, not just from the design field, how can we put these different domains together to re-envision what work can look like, how organizations can understand the universe, can understand their employees, uh, how we can redesign better meetings, better decisions, uh, better cultures. Um, To me, that is the, the biggest opportunity because that is the opportunity that can unlock Uh, all the other opportunities in a sense if we don't change how organizations work and how they uh, how people feel and 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 make decisions and and take action uh, in organizations and in collaborating with other organizations uh, we're not going to be able to leverage uh, design fully thanks chris luis you want to ping on the circular versus linear Yes, uh, just to to, make, uh, to talk a little bit on, on what uh, Chris just said, I think there are two aspects, uh, two layers of the, the, the work that we do as designers. So there's the, the process itself, uh, the approach that we use, uh, that we can bring and generate value to organizations. Uh, and then there's the outcome itself, right? Uh, so which is also a very important part of what we do. Um, and when we talk about circularity, we tend to speak about uh, the circularity of the outcomes. Uh, so it, it might be a product, it might be a service. Everything is a service in my view, because I work with service design. So uh, goods, they belong to a bigger part uh, of a system, uh, which is a, sy- a service system. But um, so, so when I was starting out, I, was, um, I got in touch with a book called Natural Capitalism. And I know that this book influenced a lot the founders of, of Live Work. Uh, and the idea of the, of the book, uh, well, is basically that we are not taking in consideration the natural resources that could go into, that get transformed and get sold uh, afterwards. Uh, so uh, services or the idea of services, uh, they, are more, they are more sustainable. They are more circular, uh, I would say. So... <clears throat> This is the first part, the outcome. Services, in general, they, they tend to be 
more sustainable and more circular as a model. When I take my clothes to a laundry, uh, it's uh, it's better because the same machine that was manufactured once gets uh, used all, over and over by many different people uh, instead of having a laundry uh, uh, in, in my in my place, right? And then uh, the, the circularity that I was trying I, I wasn't thinking about it in this way, uh, Alok. So thank you for, for bringing this idea of circularity uh, instead of linear to the process. Um, the idea is that services, you, you can't implement services all at once. Uh, there are, there's training involved, there are uh, interfaces and there are physical spaces, signage. So services are complex. They have multiple pieces. So you can't just uh, get them implemented all at once as you do with a good. Uh, so the idea of having a, a, a process that's linear uh, and then that we you get to the, to the outcome at the end of this linear process, it doesn't make sense anymore when we have a, a mutating uh, system, which is a service. So maybe a circular process, a more interactive process with many different components uh, that you, you keep following up as you implement and you observe the changes and you make new changes and et cetera, it would make a lot more sense to our uh, type of uh, design, let's say. Thanks, Luis. Uh, as a thought, uh, how can we make policymakers understand these notions? Because I have the feeling that in many parts of our planet, Policymakers are still linear thinkers. And I would be interested to have some insights from uh, some of you. William, you have been talking about the fragile interrelationships between culture and design. And I see that policymakers need to wake up on, on those tensions. Ali, Joseph, Claudia, Sonia. I don't know who wanna jump in. Well, I, I have got uh, different experiences with different governments, and it's really, um, sometimes you can't even get an appointment with them, <laughs> just number one. But once you get into the boardroom, uh, and designers are powerful enough if they are insightful and can provide solutions and to be recognized to be a valuable partner in the boardroom. And that's where you can influence uh, uh, thinkers um, who may be not really realizing what is the proper way to approach a certain problem. And, um, but you know, getting, it, uh, getting a dialogue with the government is actually very difficult uh, from my experience. Um, and particularly in Malaysia, because I think that uh, there's a kind of a very distant uh, connection between the government and the people. Uh, with the present government, uh, but we, we try to help them wherever we can by going through NGOs and trying to work with them and trying to maybe promote some ideas which we think will make the country more sustainable, uh, taking care of the poverty uh, which we see uh, around us and, and so on. Um, just to conclude, actually this one, um, this one, uh, what do you call Profession, which is pretty useless, uh, is called politicians. <laughs> and I think this is true from what I see. And I think really, I think how to get above them. And my, my best uh, recommendation is just get real best. Thank you. Thanks, William. Thanks for uh, re-provoking and provoking us. And uh, anyone uh, want to react on uh, some of the things we have been talking about? I would like to remind us two things. One which is to the audience, don't hesitate to punch in your questions in the Q&A box and add some insights. And what we will do, because the time is flying and we already had one hour of conversations between us, we'll open up to the audience and we'll have some insights of them and interact with them. And now, Sonia, you wanted to react and then yeah. some of you and then we'll open up. Yeah. So on the note about policymakers, really it starts from intention. If they have the right intention, then they're open. What we found is that some of them are really open and we work consistently and deeply 
on several issues like you know behavior change around waste management um, or, or uh, we worked on uh, uh, creating a market for organics and millets to be able to solve the problem of farmer suicides so it really depends if they have the right intention but the ones who have the right intention are few and far in between so there i would agree with william that uh, it takes a bit of looking to find them thanks sonia i see in the chat box so many insights that i'll uh, suggest to speakers to go through some of them and uh, interact uh, in the coming minutes any questions dear audience just punch them in the q and a box or put them in the uh, in the chat box Uh, though the chat box is so dense that it will be a nightmare to find back uh, your questions so help us dear audience let us redesign zoom maybe is there anyone from zoom where we can uh, have better flows so any other insights from any of the speakers before we open up to yeah i i i have just one 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 point um coming from malaysia and i think for the past I mean, since I kind of understand how the politics work, and we have, we have actually not relying on government. It's not just me; uh, it's just me and many, many of my friends, my peers. Uh, we have learned that 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 we should do it first. You know, we should do it in a smaller way. Um, then, when it's uh, well done, you know, the politician will come because they will want to be part of it. So when they come, then we squeeze them. You know, and and then we, we we sort of got them in to I mean, uh, 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 nicely to be part of it, and they can take all the the credit. That's fine, but I think I think uh, this is the only way in Malaysia. You know, like we we will hi we will hijack a a government land, and we do something re uh, really nice. Then they came and they slap a little bit on our palm our our, our hand and say, "You shouldn't do uh, do that. You should go through a proper." Uh, a, a proper procedure, and right within us, we say "fuck you," you know, and and and. But we we will abide, you know. We say, "Yeah, I'm sorry. We're so sorry about it." Then they will say, "Since you've done a, such a good job, there's another two pieces of land. Wouldn't you want to take care of that as well?" So this is Malaysia, and and I mean, th th this is a, a third world country, and and I think or developing uh, country. I think we just have to find ways that you know that if you're gonna go through a proper channel. You will you will take another five ten years, which is just gonna waste your time. You must well just do it in a smaller way and do it well. Now, Joseph, I would argue that that is the design mindset. Yes. Stop talking, start doing. Yeah, e even in a smaller way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that is what I, I think we are missing in so many places. And to come in resonance with what Louis was mentioning, yes. my provocation is that 20th century has linearized our brains. And that we have to follow steps and ask for authorization for doing stuff, and uh, we have, of course, complexities. And Chris, you are mentioning the complexity of organizational uh, structuring, and that is where we need to rethink some of the systems. And that is where we have all these conversations. Thanks, everyone, for pushing and exploring and uh, enlarging the envelope of what we are busy with. Uh, we are five minutes after the hour, if I take the hour as a kind of a bench. We have 30 minutes left, and uh, these 30 minutes are precious because we want our audience to join the conversation. I uh, would like to point one important element. It's not because nine of us are having the flow here that we are owning the conversation. The conversation is owned by all of us, so please uh, jump in ask and uh, we try to address that as much as possible and i have then a complex uh, question how are we going to continue the conversation after all this because we have seen so many interesting insights so i'll jump into beginning to look into questions but before that i would like us to remind that design culture innovation has many narratives And having all of us here together shows that we are breaking the monoculture, the only narrative that we see in many places. And I would like to thank all of you to contribute to all this multiplicity of narratives. And this being said, I see a question 
there by Daniel. Since we are provocating each other, I believe as a designer that design is responsible for a lot of the problems we are currently facing. What do you think? Does it make sense? Am I wrong or crazy? Anyone want to jump into that? I have some points on that, but I would like all of you to begin to feed into that. Daniel, your question is putting all the speakers in frozen mode. <laughs> what are we going to do? I'm happy to say a short one. Uh, this is kind of what I was getting at before, right? That, that um, we typically have in the executive framework, right? The desirability, do users or customers want a solution? Technical feasibility, can it be done? And viability, can it make green, right? Can it yeah. make money? If we can take those three boxes, then we're awesome designers, right? Now we're adding the sustainability box to the question or a circle to the Venn diagram and saying, well, we could, we have actually built many things that people love that can make money and that were feasible to produce that was terrible for the planet or terrible for other people, right? So now, now comes this question of uh, with great power comes a uh, great responsibility, uh, ethical design. Uh, I was speaking at a conference in Copenhagen uh, where there were many people kind of bringing these questions in. Uh, some folks from Google and some of the big tech giants mm -hmm. were saying these internal discussions they had in these firms around uh, making apps addictive, for example, right? Uh, it's uh, very valuable for tech companies to make uh, people constantly open the app and feel, am I missing out? Fear, fear missing yeah. out for more. But actually, is it good for the user? <laughs> is it good for the parents <laughs> or is it good for the kids uh, that the parents are hooked? Instead of talking to the kids, they talk to some stranger across the planet, right? So, so, uh, so I think, yes, I think we have a responsibility, but more importantly, and many people have a responsibility and we have, we have part of it, but I think we have more an opportunity to bring in designerly ways of working to non-designers. So I think it's not enough to rely on designers becoming more ethical. I think we need to bring designerly ways of work to people that are not trained as designers. For example, I'm not a trained designer. I'm just a hacker. <laughs> yeah. Great. If, but if I would I, argue if, that if, designer if, is hacker or hacker is designer. Who want to yes. react on? No, I, I just want to, uh, because there's a lot of talk about designers having a, a code of ethics uh, right now. Uh, <clears throat> but, you know, sometimes I... And, and I'm a trained designer, but I'm also an industrial engineer. So I originally wasn't a designer and then I, I became a designer. So, and, and sometimes we put ourselves in a, in a special place as designers uh, and, and I'm putting myself within this, this, this consideration. Uh, but I don't think there should be a code of ethics specifically for designers. I mean, we, are, we have the responsibility as the someone from finance that's going to approve the budget to the project has the, the responsibility. And as the CEO that's taking all the decisions has, and the, someone from uh, the more uh, operational side has. And, and so everyone shares the responsibility of whatever a company is doing. Uh, I, 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 and, and I'm not trying to skip or avoid uh, like, like uh, dodge the responsibility or anything like this. I just, I just think that as designers, we tend to involve and gather thoughts and ideas and knowledge from all over the place to, to do something, to create something. And everybody that's participating on the creation of, of this something has a responsibility. It's not a solely responsibility of designers, in my opinion. But of course, we do have a responsibility because everybody has. Thanks, Luis. Claudia, you're nodding. Anything you want to add on the, that vein before we move to the next question? And uh... I just, I just agree. I think it's uh, besides of that. That is, everyone needs to to put the shoes on the problem. Uh, we also need to address like baby steps, like small actions, and turn the mind, the design mindset into an ab habit. So that it's going to be easier to address those magical ideas for the future. If we start doing it, like changing small things, small habits, small ways of working inside our corporation with our clients in the society, we got, I think we can, we'll be able to change something instead of building an amaz amazing project, amazing goal. That's what I have in mind. Thanks. Ali. Yeah, Sonia and then Ali, if I may. 
So uh, I'm glad somebody mentioned Gandhiji there. So I really believe that we need to be the change we wish to see. We can't pass on that responsibility. Uh, and we can't say others are also responsible. We have to be the change we wish to see because we are the change makers. As designers, we are the ones who create the next, right? So we have to take that responsibility, I believe. Okay, Ali? Hi, I think um, I'd like to address the second question more than the first, if that's okay. okay. Are we done with the first question, though? Sure. Uh, I, I, hope Dan I hope Daniel is happy. Okay. So, so uh, the second question says, today's era, most of us like to work individually and they decline to work in team. But one can learn more in team. How can we start working as a team? How to make people come on the same platform and share ideas? So I decided that I could probably answer this question because at my age, I'm almost like a veteran freelancer. So I've been freelancing for so many years that, um, uh, so I understand how it, 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 it's great to work individually. I get to decide uh, on many things. Uh, I have, like, for example, one of the decisions I made for myself is that um, I will only work with organizations or companies where I have direct access to the decision maker. Uh, otherwise, you know, that personal, there's, otherwise there's no reason why they should work with someone like me. Uh, so I, I try to only work with people who I can bring some benefit to. But uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about is um, um, the idea of us as um, design people um, or as I'm not sure what the word we use is for all of us collectively, but uh, the thing that I wanted to talk about was leadership, uh, individuality, but also leadership. And that's why I'd like to um, encourage you to think not in terms of team, but in terms of creative collaboration. And I think that's a, a really, really important thing that needs to happen more and more now in our interconnected world. Um, so uh, I, I I work, I've been working alone, but not alone for many years now. Um, I, for different projects, I seek out different people. So, so how, how to make people come on the same platform and share ideas? Um, think sideways. Don't look for the usual suspects in, when you want to collaborate. Um, you know, for example, um, uh, you don't need to work with a photographer who um, is only specialized in one thing. You can maybe, if you have the confidence, uh, challenge that photographer to photograph something that's completely out of his comfort zone. Um, we had this project uh, where we um, got a bunch of children uh, to to take photos, and and why not? Um, let's let's learn to uh, let's learn to put our ego to one side. And, and think about the wider possibilities uh, because, um, yeah, two things, um, leadership. Um, leadership to me also is about, um, because we've kind of, in the in the fearful old days, pre-internet, pre, -internet, pre uh, before we were, we were that connected, um, there was a lot of, our, we were working in fear. We were always fearful that someone would copy our idea. We were talking so much about, you know, our rights to our copyright, our, our, our. Um, but nowadays, I mean, come on, guys, you know, like, uh, who really has an original idea these days? It's not about how original your idea is anymore. I mean, who cares about that logo you did? You put that logo in Google reverse image search, you will find two million other logos that look almost like it, right? It's about, it's about what you say, it's about what you choose not to say, it's about how you present yourself, it's about your accountability to the world. Um, all those things matter. And that's why, and we cannot, we cannot do all that alone. The client cannot do it alone. We as a designer cannot do it alone. Um, at the community, that's where the community needs to come in. So um, go out there and, and, and find people in the most unusual places. Like I said, children can take photos. We've even did a project where we, we had a few blind people who were interested in taking photos. Anything is possible. Thanks, Ali. I think it uh, comes also in resonance with Chris uh, when you are talking about organizational uh, design, if I may use that word, and the notion of creative collaboration that Ali is pushing has to push us to rethink the notion of organizational design. Uh, 
that would be my taking uh, an insight out of these dynamics. And I find that uh, super interesting. And it comes into some conversation we had with Sonia. How can we make sure that stuff happen by, and, and it, it goes back to what Joseph and William, you mentioned about resources. What do we mean by resources today and how do we reconnect them in, in some new interesting ways? And, and that is where uh, we see some uh, insights, which I'm sure will feed Louis thinking about the notion of services being not uh, rigid. Uh, and where are all these connections and how can we think about the next? So fascinating, fascinating. Uh, and that was a question by Anonymous. Everybody knows Anonymous, of course. <laughs> Shall we move to the, the next one? How regional culture informs the running of design business here in India. Sonia, you want to jump into that? And then I'm interested in how regional culture informs the running of design business in Brazil or in Malaysia, because we are interested in multiple narratives. So I love the density you were talking about. I mean, there is so much depth, uh, depth in the culture, and there is so much value there. I mean, if you take something like turmeric and the value it has for the world, you know, there is in the languages and the nuances and all of that is great material, you know, uh, to start designing from. And I think we have that and maybe we come back a full circle. And in that full circle, there is all of this depth that we can use. And in designing a lot of the retail that we have in India, we've actually looked back at some of that. For instance, you have rose jam in Turkey. But you also have rose jam in in uh, in India in with the Tamil community, and so we said, no, but why don't we celebrate it? There is so much to celebrate in culture um, that it becomes a great palette to take from and paint the future with. And I'm sure all cultures have that, but the 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 depth and the plurality of what we have in India is just so tremendous. And so dense that we can really pick up from there and create from there. And I'm sure we have that uh, density in Malaysia, in right. Brazil. Yes. And that is why I'm so interested in these interconnections between uh, uh, all these geographies. And in Europe with Chris and Claudia, we know that there are so much nuance which are under the radar. And Design Open, we are aiming to try to put the light on these topics. Like if you go to Copenhagen today, the landscape has changed in 30 years. Fascinating. And uh, it's not only about the chair, if I may say so, Chris. We are not only designing chairs. There are so many stuff happening. So uh, great. William, Sonia was mentioning that we are circling back on culture and you are the one who yes. came up as a first provocator on this notion of culture. Any insights before we move to the next question? Yeah, sure. Um, I, um, I'm not sure whether you, uh, our audience know of it, but I started an organization called the Design Alliance Asia in the year 2000. Uh, it is still very active, by the way. So the, the main reason is really uh, Asia is actually um, very diverse, but there's a lot of similarity, similarities in each of the different countries. So we were invited to do a presentation in, uh, in Japan for the design week. And the Japanese actually asked the design islands whether we can present Asia in half an hour. Now we got about 10 countries. Half an hour means each country is only allotted a few minutes. <laughs> so that, that is quite impossible. And so we kind of turned down the talk and said it's impossible to really give an overview of the culture of Asia in half an hour. And they came back to us, okay, we got a slot for you uh, for the final session of Design Week. You've got three and a half hours to explain Asia. <laughs> now that is even longer than the Lord of the Rings and we were I kind of panicking. But it came out the format where we managed to keep the audience active. One of the ideas was actually to present simultaneous uh, audio visual, three countries, one at, 
uh, a series of three countries, three countries, three countries, and we chose the most diverse countries. The first presentation was uh, Laos, which is at that time the poorest country in Asia, Singapore, one of the richest, and Indonesia, a Muslim country. And we projected images on the screen. We realized that we got so much in common. You know, when we showed the text, uh, textiles of Laos, of Indonesia, and Singapore, Malaysia, there were so many similar concepts, so many similar colors and patterns that we were all really interconnected and we didn't realize that. So the, the, the function of the Design islands is really to come together every year where each of us do, uh, we are now 14 countries, each of us do a presentation for about half an hour. And through that one, two days, we begin to understand Asia, how interconnected it is and how diverse it is. So this is a continuing study, uh, which we uh, still exploring. And it is actually, um, there are a lot of similar things where we can also advise corporations, especially corporations which are moving into various regions. Um, and, and so we have actually set up a consultancy in that sense uh, to kind of help them along the cultural, um, to be more culturally sensitive, to be more aware of local uh, sensibilities and talents and so on. Yeah. So um, that's one way to do it. I think everybody should collaborate in this way <laughs> across regions, across countries, across even cities of your own country. You learn so much. The knowledge is amazing. Yeah. Thanks, William. My, my designerly takeaway from this insight, and I'm sure that Luis, Chris, or Clarissa, yeah. you'll react on that, is we as designers, our obsession is to look at patterns yes. and try to extract insights, bottom up, emergent, and not impose a yeah. grid which is de facto pre built. And that is what I, I think is interesting to reflect on. Uh, Luis, Clarissa? Go ahead, Clarissa. I've, I've talked too much already. <laughs> 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 I love this idea of patterns, uh, Alok, and I think this is really uh, one of our abilities to look at patterns and to zoom in, zoom in and zoom out of any situation, context or challenge. So I think this is really something that um, we have. And uh, of course, we can other people also have that, but it is, is, is a special characteristic, I think, of the design way of doing things, designerly ways of doing, uh, to mention Nigel Cross. And I think um, this capability of zooming in and zooming out gives us a very wide, uh, wide uh, perspective of things because we have the capacity of looking very close and looking very far away from every, um, uh, to, to every challenge, really. So um, this, I think, is one of the, um, is one of the key gold, um, um, resources that we might have as um, designers and also as humanity and to be able to really look at things broadly and to to understand what's happening really without really judging or without really giving uh, your perspective but looking at things from a global uh, wide lens which we are doing today here so um, I always think that things like um, meetings like this are really like not just us doing and talking, but this will spread. And we'll, I hope this will inspire people, inspire us to, to create projects, to really help someone or help an organization or help people inside the organization because these people also need help um, to really uh, establish maybe some, some kind of balance to be able to move forward as humanity really. So thank you very much, everyone. I'm so glad that we made this happen. Thank you a lot for making this happen with Sonia. Thanks. Thanks, Claude. There is Larissa who's mentioning, let's design futures together. So uh, yes, jumping Larissa. on that, uh, Claudia, Sonia, let's design futures together. How can we uh, reflect on this notion of futures and try to push our thinking? Any so, uh, insights you want to yeah. share? So I looked so I actually was hoping I'd get to talk about this um, <clears throat> and listening to everyone somehow this came up in my head. Um, I've been completely fascinated by this phenomenon. I don't know if everybody else is following it 
of this song, which is Jerusalem. Has anybody seen it? Uh, it you is sure? completely crazy. Okay, it's so I'm coming out of the design bubble for a moment to just talk to you about this phenomenon. This one DJ is sitting somewhere in Africa, and he listens to this beat, and he thinks that the beat is very positive, very spiritual. So he catches hold of his sister and says, "Let's make a song to this." They make a song, okay, and it comes from the heart. It doesn't come from the brain. It's more intuitive. Maybe now is the time for us as designers to come more from the heart, more intuitive. You know, use sound, use the sensorial. And so they make a song and they put it out there. In Angola, some other people make a choreography to it. Today, it's a phenomenon. It's a so it became like the anthem of this very negative time, like a positive anthem. And you know, airlines are doing it. Monks are doing it. You know, people all over the world are responding to that choreography. It doesn't matter where it came from, because it's positive. It moves your spirit. It's so beautiful. You know, I mean, I think, and there's something we can learn as designers from that. So you should uh, you should Google on Jerusalem uh, on Google yeah. or YouTube, and you'll find thousands of choreography inspired by that. And it's quite a fascinating phenomenon. So when it comes Which, to culture, you know, you're bringing so many cultures together. Everyone's responding. So to William's point, where there is, you know, there's so much similarity in cultures. So the positive thread across is the same. And in a negative time, maybe we can bring in that positivity, Ali's humor, bring in, you know, bring in that positive spirit as designers and bring people together to do that. So I, so for me, that is fascinating. And if we can learn from there as designers, it would be useful. Great, thanks. I see that there are quite a number of questions we need to address and there is uh, only 11 minutes left because we have that 99 minutes uh, constraint and we have to respect the time of the others. And so how are we going to deal with that? That is a design problem. We need to Anyone? have another, another meeting to wow. schedule another meeting, maybe, maybe one month from now. Great, Claudia. Are we all ready for having uh, version number two of this and continue some of the conversations? And bring new people, for sure, maybe from dif different disciplines. Okay, so that's already one concrete next step. Sonia, Claire, we need to work on that with Clo. Yes, yeah. Okay. Uh, any other insights before we try to address two or three questions and then we have to land back and finish our 99 minutes? I see uh, Avik Guha Takurta. Can mass customization be the guiding design principles in present time? Is it practically possible to achieve that in all scenarios? Luis, you want to react on that one? Oh, uh, this that's is, a um, yeah. yeah. Uh, Avik, you are killing Luis. Luis is getting a little yes. bit nervous. So, uh, I mean, the, the mass customization uh used to be a very important term uh when there were no screens and we didn't have this device uh, right here that uh, would change itself more easily uh with um with every user right with every person so now with codes uh, the idea of mass customization uh is um is 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 it's not that it's simple, but it's not as complex as it used to be. Because when the term uh, emerged, I think it was more uh, thought of as uh, something for physical objects. And, uh, and you could cust customize, like I remember shoes where you could add your name to a, to a sneaker, right? So the idea of mass customization was harder. But now uh, we get customized experiences with our digital interfaces. So I think this is more, I would say it's, it's something that it's more that, that as this, a design principle is, is, is a design, uh, uh, it's, it's given almost right now, whenever you are designing, something will be somehow customized for you. You expect it to be, right? Um, that that's my thought. 
But yeah. it's a, a difficult question. I have I, I never thought about it, to be, to be honest. Great. So, so that is the value of these conversations also. It's opening our own envelope. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Chris, you want to react on that before we jump into another question and then we begin to land? Yeah, I, I guess maybe my thought is uh, I, I agree very much with what Luis said. And I, I guess um, to some extent, I think uh, there is... Uh, there were some questions, for example, around uh, kind of uh, being a young designer and what are we getting hired for? How can we become leaders? These sort of questions, right? So I think there may be some people on, on this call who's like curious about how can I create an impact in the world, but also have a have a decent life, right? Mm -hmm. So I guess that um, it's about seeking the right spaces and seeking the right people where you can get the right mandate and don't don't uh, don't let other people define your future, right? I would say to that question. Building on this question around um, uh, mass customization, I think there's a huge opportunity in using design together with, for example, finance, we see uh, cryptocurrency, blockchain, and so on, to create new economic opportunities for design and for designers and entrepreneurs. Because as long as we are optimizing the old model, uh, which a lot of design is doing still, right? A lot of digitalization is just taking the old services and putting it in new tubes. Um, what if we can rewire, uh, for example, uh, we've seen some of these plays online in terms of using the power of the crowd to change economic value uh, in the markets and, and that kind of hacking behavior. It's not that all of it worked well, but but there's some, something interesting around uh, creating new platforms, platform design that isn't platforms set up to rip us all off uh, as consumers and use our data and sell it, but platforms that are set up, set up to make us stronger and make the 1% less strong, to be completely honest. So I think there is also a question of why are we designing in the first, first place? Why is design so important? Uh, what do we believe in as designers? Uh, what world are we designing for? Um, and how can we create uh, individual lives and communities and experiences where you can balance uh, your own life, well-being and economy uh, with doing work you believe in, right? Um, so I think that's what a lot of designers are struggling with that I know is that where the money is, is often uh, in, in working with the dirty brands or doing the good old boring thing. And I think that a lot of people may be telling themselves, oh, this is the only option I have. But I think, well, design your career as well, design yourself. Look for those Thanks, Chris. And I guess we'll have a quick tour with the speakers. And I'm sorry for all the questions which are not yet addressed, but time is flying and uh, we'll have to envision, as Claudia was suggesting, maybe a V2 of uh, Design Open Dice and reconnect all of us. Uh, meanwhile, I see that Colette is enjoying uh, looking at priests and nuns dancing under Jerusalem tune, which is uh, <laughs> quite fun. Uh, let's have a, a final tour de table, uh, Clara, Clarissa. Uh, I've already said um, all my emotions and feelings about this uh, group together, and um, I'm really glad we're able to really share across the globe and. Um, so many insightful thoughts uh, about the audience uh, from the audience. Thank you so much for all the questions because it's making me think. I wanted to write down everything, but I hope it's all registered. I asked Alok. And, I hope so. Uh, I think our our goal is achieved of provoking and uh, making us ourselves ourselves think about all these questions, and also uh, thinking uh, using Alok's expression, thinking back to the audience and. In a, in, a, in a great, uh, very wide conversation. So I'm already thinking, how can we continue this? Not only online, but maybe, uh, uh, of course online, but not only um, like, like this, but in, in some other ways uh, of continuing the conversation and really building things from this. So I love the idea of landing. So thank you for being in this airplane with us across the globe. Since we cannot fly in a real airplane, we are flying <laughs> here in a virtual airplane. Thank you very much, everyone. That's a nice metaphor. Thanks, Larissa. Thanks for making sure all these connections yeah. took place. Uh, Ali, you want to add a few words? Uh, we have okay. four minutes left. Sorry, I'm uh, pushing with the uh, time, but uh, you know, I'm the Pecha Kucha organizer of Brussels, so I have a <laughs> clock in the head. I, I think only in 20 seconds. So I just want to very quickly uh, address something I uh, 
I noticed a comment after what I said um, where the uh, person was bothered to say, of course, there are original ideas. I, I apologize. I think I, I made the, the wrong impression um, when I said where it for original ideas or, or something like that to that effect. I think what I mean is um, how do we build on the on an idea? Um, how do we how do we how do we I guess it is uh, how do we take ownership of our ideas and be the design leaders to um, you know instead of um, I think there are a lot a lot of us work in this industry especially the, the older ones are a bit they're a bit more jaded and we find ourselves complaining a lot about how things weren't how they were uh, how in the good old days um, you know you can't charge the same amount for a logo these days for example because there's a, something called fiber.com who will have a new design logo for five US dollars things like that right but um Ali if I may your audio seems to be breaking ah I see sorry yeah okay um so um can you hear me better now yes yeah very okay. much so but time is um, flying so I'll put pressure on you be careful okay yeah so um I think what I was just going to say is that um keep moving keep going forward um don't um stay with the things that um are making you feel um diminished feeling making you feel like your your job is less important these days keep looking forward keep finding new uh, new ways that you can be relevant because it's what you have here and here that's most important Great, which is in resonance with uh, Sonia's uh, mention of Jerusalem. It comes from the herd. Joseph, William, you each have 10 seconds, Luis, and then Sonia, and then we'll have to thank everyone. And uh, as Clarissa was mentioned, the plan is landing. Yeah, okay, for me, uh, yeah, for me, I think uh, I, I picked up from what William was saying is on observation. I think uh, with, with the world that we are in now, I think we have to make that observation within ourselves and also on the world around us. I think through that observation, I think we were able to see uh, uh, clarity and to understand yourself and the world around you. I think that's, that's probably what I, just my takeaway, yeah. Great, thanks. William, and then uh, okay. I, I'm afraid we'll close. Yeah, um, during the course of this conversation, I remembered two quite uh, interesting experiences I had. I managed to change the outcome of two board meetings by really like in the coffee shop, just talking to the CEO, one-to-one -one basis. He listened, I listened, and we speak. And maybe that's a way to change public policy in that sense, because uh, it seemed to work for me. Uh, and I remember several instances where I succeeded. Thanks, William. Here comes the 99 famous minutes. Thanks everyone yeah. for having uh, played the game with us. And uh, designopen.in will host the recorded version of this. And uh, Sonia, Clarissa, myself, and all of you, let's uh, think offline how to keep a trace of all these conversations and maybe open a space where uh, people can contribute and continue to uh, add some layers of insights on designopen.in slash conversations. So that is something Sonia and myself will be uh, exploring. And uh, many, many, many thanks from uh, us to the audience and to all of you having contributed to that. We know that 99 minutes is uh, quite a short time, but we had such a fascinating and dense moment that uh, I would just say one word, or let us say two words. Thank you. Thank you all, and uh, enjoy the day in Brazil and uh, on that part of the world. Enjoy the evening in uh, Malaysia, Southeast Asia, but you are from so many parts of the world that uh, enjoy each second, each minute, each hour. Thank you, everyone, and have a fantastic future. Stay tuned on designopen.in because we'll try to make sure that things are being uh, continued in terms of conversation.